Have you ever wondered if plants were really alive? Compared to animals, they don't seem to do much. Yet, in one sense, plants have been more successful than animals. Individual plants outnumber animals 100 to 1. They also make up far more of the Earth's biomass. So it's only fair to admit plants must be doing something right. If you look deep inside a living plant, you'll find a busy, complex organism packed with specialized systems and subsystems, just like in animals. Materials move throughout the plant, and growth and repair take place continuously. Plants may act at a pace that seems slow to us, but their cells work together in remarkably effective ways to ensure the plant's survival. So let's take a look at these amazing organisms. Get your papers ready, wide right, skinny left. So let's get to the root of the issue and start at the bottom and look first at roots. The function of roots is to anchor plants to the ground and to absorb nutrients and water from the soil. Plants also help to protect the soil from erosion with their root systems. During the Dust Bowl, the plains experienced a severe drought and farmers couldn't plant. Since there were no crops in the soil, as windstorms blew up, all the topsoil was blown away. So planting along hillsides and areas prone to erosion is very important to farmers. There are two main types of roots. Tap roots, as you see here, are found in plants called dicots. More on that later. Tap roots are usually very thick with smaller shoots smaller roots shooting off to the side as you see in the diagram. The carrot is a really good example of a taproot. The blazing star and the sunflower are also good examples but they're not as easy to identify. The other type of root system is a fibrous root system as I see on the far right diagram. This is found in monocots. Grasses all have a fibrous root system where the roots resemble a big tangled mess. The roots tend to be thinner and there are lots of them. Rhizoids are not true roots, but they do function in much the same way. They're found in mosses and bryophytes, and they're only a few cells long. Since they are so small and delicate, they are always near a water supply. You may also not think about this, or may not know about it, but a lot of roots are edible. In the picture to the right, there's a lot of examples of edible roots. How many have you tried? Lastly, there are two main root parts that we need to mention. The meristem is the zone of growth in the root, and it's found at the very tip, and the root hairs. Root hairs are the small root-like structures that grow off the side of a root. They increase the surface area, and when there is increased surface area, there is more space to absorb water and nutrients. So, we've gotten to the root of the matter, let's stem the so we really don't want to stem the flow of information, but we do want to discuss stems. The main function of a stem is to produce leaves, branches, and flowers. But it also is to support the leaves so that they can gather sunlight. And another function of stems is to transport water, minerals, and nutrients all around the plant. So they're pretty busy. There are two distinct arrangements within the stem of different types of plants. The vascular bundles. Monocots have vascular bundles of xylem and phloem scattered throughout the stem, while dicots have vascular bundles of xylem and phloem arranged in a ring around the edge of the stem as you see in the picture to the right. More on those in a bit. Can you think of stems that you eat? You actually eat quite a bit of them. Some edible stems are shown in the picture to the right celery, fennel, asparagus. You also use a stem product on your waffles and pancakes. Gathering maple syrup is not a very quick task, but the end result is so good, and it comes from a stem. Rubber is also tapped from trees, and it's processed to make gum and gum products. Not to leave things alone, let's turn over a new leaf. Leaves have one function. Can you guess? It's to gather as much sunlight as possible so photosynthesis can take place. And leaves are varied in their adaptations to gather that sunlight. 
from the huge leaves of the banana plant, like you see here, to the thin needles of a pine tree. Three main processes take place in leaves. The first one, as we already said, is photosynthesis. Remember, sunlight plus water plus carbon dioxide yields the carbohydrate, sugar, and oxygen. Transpiration is the second process that takes place in leaves. Remember in the water cycle, this is excess water leaving the plant, usually through openings on the underside of leaves. And the third process is the gas exchange. Oxygen and carbon dioxide for each other, whether it's in respiration or photosynthesis. That also takes place in leaves. So how does a leaf do all these things? That's a really good question. There are two main parts that you need to, you need to think about in these three tasks. In the leaf cell are small structures called chloroplasts. You see the chloroplasts here as little green globs. The chloroplasts contain a chemical called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is green and it traps light energy from the sun and it converts it into heat energy which fuels the process of photosynthesis. So that's one structure. The second set of structures that we need to talk about are stomata and guard cells. They allow for the exchange of gases during respiration and photosynthesis and they allow for the escape of excess water from transpiration. The stoma or singular, the stoma is the singular word, it's the opening and the guard cells are the doors. In this picture the little red arrow is pointing to the guard cells. When the guard cells are turgid or full of water, as you see in the left, the, the stoma opens and water and gases can go in and out and photosynthesis takes place at a pretty good rate. When the guard cells have less water, like on a hot, dry, windy day, the guard cells relax and the stoma closes, conserving water, lessening the gas exchange, so photosynthesis slows down. Plants, like animals, also have vascular tissue. Our veins and arteries and capillaries move materials around and so does the vascular tissue in plants. However, plants don't have a beating heart. They rely on capillary action to move things upwards and they rely on gravity to move things down. Remember the experiment with the paper towel and the beakers? Capillary action. It's coming to visit us again. There are two main types of vascular tissue. Xylem which has special cells called tracheids. The tracheids act like valves. Xylem moves water and it moves water in one direction, up. No matter how big the plant is, 400 feet tall, it moves water up from the ground. The other structure that you see, or the other piece of vascular tissue that you see in stems is phloem. Phloem moves food all around the plant. As you can see in this picture, the xylem are located towards the center of the plant. Now this is a really good adaptation. Think about it. When it's hot and dry, being closer to the center of the plant helps the plant conserve water. So that's a pretty clever adaptation. On the other hand, phloem is located closer to the outside of the, of the stem. Food, the food in a plant, is a carbohydrate, sugar, and it's less likely to evaporate. Because of this too, we can harv harvest maple syrup and gum, just like we saw in the last slide. Pretty cool. Ice cream cones? No, sorry to say, nope. Instead, we're going to talk about reproductive structures of seed-bearing plants, the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. So let's take a quick look. First, the gymnosperms. Gymnosperms have pollen grains and ovules, the male and female reproductive cells, in cones. You're probably familiar with pine pollen, which you see all over your cars, that yellow dust in the last few weeks. That stuff came from the male pollen cones that you see here in the picture. If you look down on the ground, you see the little brown shriveled up ones when the pollen's all gone from them. However, we are much more familiar with the large brown seed cones. Pay attention to the pine trees around you right now. You'll see the immature cones that look very much like this. 
The seeds are contained inside the cones and when it matures and opens the seeds fall out. Now the term gymnosperm literally means naked seed and there are a few trees that may not look like a gymnosperm but they are. The ginkgo tree is one example. The structures that you see here are the seeds, not a fruit. They're not enclosed in an ovary, which you're going to see as we talk about angiosperms. Ginkgos are also pretty nasty smelling, the fruit is, or the seed. They smell like vomit, so you definitely don't want them around your house. Angiosperms are the most recent in terms of evolutionary adaptations, and they're the most numerous. They're the flowering plants. They have pollen grains and ovules as well, but they are contained in a structure called a flower. The flower has parts that hold the pollen grains, or male gametes, and parts that contain the ovules, or female gametes. Remember, a gamete is a haploid sex cell, so it only has half the number of chromosomes. Ovules are contained in an ovary. This structure is very different from the cones of gymnosperms. When pollination takes place and the ovules are fertilized, the ovary grows and ripens and becomes a fruit or a seed vessel. The flesh of the fruit, when it falls, rots and enriches the soil, increasing the chances that the seed is going to grow. Pretty amazing, I think. So lastly, we're going to look at seeds. Now, whether we look at a gymnosperm seed or an angiosperm seed, they all start out the same. A pollen grain fertilizes an ovule and a seed forms and begins to grow. As the seed grows, cells begin to differentiate just like in an animal and they specialize forming several different types of tissues and organs. So let's take a look at those. In a typical seed, the seed coat or testa protects the seed from drying out. Some seeds have thin seed coats, others have very thick seed coats. But they all do the same thing. They protect the seed and the embryonic or baby plant. In a bean seed, the plant embryo is very easy to see. The plant embryo has three main parts. The primary or first root that you see here, also called the radical. As we move up and around that root, parts of that root will become the stem as well. Next, we see this little leaf-looking thing. This is called the plumule. The plumules will be the first true leaves and when the plant gets ready to start doing photosynthesis. Lastly, are the most obvious part of the seed, that big part, the cotyledons, or seed leaves. These are stuffed with food made from photosynthesis by the plant, remember, carbohydrates and they'll provide energy to the plant as it germinates and roots and stems begin to grow and before the leaves sprout and start doing photosynthesis. Eventually the cotyledons will wither and fall off when they're no longer needed. Lastly, let's talk about monocots and dicots because we've mentioned them several times here. So there are five main differences and we've talked about a couple already. The prefix mono means one, and cotyledon, cot is short for cotyledon. So a monocot has one seed leaf, and a dicot has two cotyledons or two seed leaves. Now what if you can't see the seeds? Well, we're going to look at the veins on the leaves. A monocot has parallel veins, like you see here on the left while dicots have a branching pattern, like you see on the right. Grasses are a good example of monocots, and the veins on an oak tree are a great example of a dicot. The grasses, the leaves are only parallel. An oak tree, they branch out. Looking at the vascular bundles also helps us tell the difference. Remember, vascular bundles are xylem and phloem together. Monocots have the vascular bundles scattered throughout the stem of the plant, while dicots have vascular bundles in a ring near the edge of the stem. Are maple trees monocots or dicots? Remember, we can get the sap from just tapping into the bark of the tree pretty easily. 
If you look at the roots of the plant, you can also tell if it's a monocot or a dicot.